So you've got a game idea. Maybe it's a grand sprawling action RPG, or it's a physics-based rage-inducing co-op platformer, or it's a tiny idler that couldn't possibly take long to make. Most people, including me at first, when we have an idea like this, make the same mistake. We jump right into trying to make the whole game. We open up Godot, grab some free assets, and just start throwing ideas around willy-nilly. And a month later, we've got a mess of code, a game that looks nothing like we imagined, and usually, we quit. And because the code we made is hyper-specific to the first game, when we move on to a new project, we have to start fresh. That's because we skipped the boring, but crucial step, and it's not the prototyping. It's building components. You may have never even heard of components, but you have been using them. Things like rigid bodies, collision shapes, and character bodies are all essentially components. They're building blocks. Imagine how much harder it would be to make games if every time you wanted something to be affected by gravity, you had to rewrite a physics engine. But you don't. You just drag in a rigid body, tweak a few variables, and it just works. Not just in one project, but in every project. These built-in nodes have been created because they are so common across all games that it just makes sense to have them available. But you aren't limited to just Godot's built-in nodes. You can, and should, make your own. That way, whenever inspiration strikes, you can quickly throw together a prototype to see if a game is worth playing instead of spending a week starting from ground zero. Here's a few I think you should make. Almost every game has at least one object with health. Some objects have health without you even really knowing it. Take Minecraft. Yes, the players have health, and the mobs have health, and even the animals have health. But so do the blocks. They can all be mined, and after a certain amount of damage, they're destroyed. Instead of going through every script and adding in a health variable and functions to take damage and die, you can just add this script here to a node and place it on them. It's just a simple script with an exported max health variable, so you can quickly set it in the inspector. Then it's only got a few functions. One to reset the current health to the max health. One to take damage and emit a signal when our health changes. And one to emit a signal when the health goes below zero. Why use signals and not just use Q3 to destroy the parent node? Because it's not the health component's job. It doesn't need to worry about what happens after we die. It just needs to let us know that we have. If it's on a player, death will take us to the death menu. If it's on an enemy, death will spawn loot. If it's on a chest, death will drop all the items inside. The next component kind of goes hand in hand with the health component, and that's a hitbox. This is just an area 2D with a script that listens for collisions. You can set a reference to the health component in the inspector, and when something enters the area, it checks. Have we assigned the health component? If yes, does the body that's entered the area have a damage method? If yes, apply damage. That's it. Now all you need to do is add the node to anything that needs to check for collisions. Add a collision shape as a child, and you're done. By keeping it generic, you don't need a player hitbox, an enemy hitbox, and a projectile hitbox. It's all one system. YouTube even has its own components. The subscribe, like, and comment button are all components that you should test out right now. Of course, what would a game be without a good character controller? It could be the difference between a fun and fluid experience and one you never want to go back to. It doesn't matter if it's 2D or 3D, just pick one that matches the type of games you like making. Whilst it's a bit more complicated than one single component, having one solid, flexible player controller means you can just drop it in any world you set up and start experimenting. Every controller is different. Mine might be for a 2D platformer, and yours might be for an FPS or third-person RPG. Whatever it is, it's worth taking some time to focus on just creating a really good version of it yourself. Do some research when making it, because there's usually hidden features that you don't even think about when playing, but make a world of difference. Things like jump buffering, coyote time, head bob, FOV changes when running, all of these are what makes a juicy controller. Once you have a player set up, you need to spawn it. So why not make a player spawner as well? All you need to add is a few exported variables, a reference to the scene you want to spawn, a marker to determine the location to spawn, and optionally, a node you want to spawn them as a child of in the scene tree. Then, you can just add a function to spawn the assigned player, and you're done. You can call it when the node loads, or you can pass another node a reference to the spawner and let them control the spawn function. That way your player can get respawned when they die. The final component I'm going to go over is one that I almost always forget, but is really important. The pause menu. When I was first starting out, I thought setting up a pause function would be way more complicated than it was. I thought you'd have to go through every node individually and add a check to some global paused variable. But in actual fact, you just have to set pause to true on the tree. Everything that has its process mode set to inherit will then stop running the process function. Without the process function, nothing moves. We can then change our pause component to process mode always. That way we can use it to pause and unpause the scene and show and hide any UI we want inside of it. Those are just five, but there are plenty more you'll eventually want. Things like a camera controller with follow, zoom, and shake, an inventory system if you're making RPGs or crafting games, an audio manager to centralize your sound effects and music, and something that probably deserves its own video, a state machine for AI, and complex player actions. Of course, there's probably versions of all of these pre-made for you in your game engine's asset store. 
and you can absolutely use them if you want to. I just know that I personally struggle to read through someone else's code and feel much more confident using something I've created myself because when it breaks, I know how to fix it. If you spend just a few days making more of these, you'll end up saving weeks or even months of dev time in the long run. You don't waste weeks reinventing the wheel. You open up a new project, drag in your toolbox, and boom, you're already halfway to a playable prototype. It's also just a great way to learn to code if you're struggling with that. I hope this helped.